Hello, City Afan. As their seven ugly sisters stumble around at the ball, the purple Cinderella waltzes away with three points. But can Italiano's men humble Prince Vlaovic with a shock top four spot? We'll discuss that, Juve's missed opportunity in the Champions League, and a whole lot more in this episode of Scudetto. Hello and welcome to Scudetto. What a crazy week of football that was. Uh, the top guns falling over each other to throw points away. Uh, but anyway, I'm glad you can all be here with us to digest it. And joining us also from Tel Aviv is Boaz. So, Mr. Sacchetti, tell us, how was your week? I've had a pretty good week. I signed up for the Tel Aviv half marathon. That is uh, a marathon divided by two this week on a whim. And uh, it's in two days' time, and I've just checked the weather, and there's an <laughs> almighty storm coming in. So maybe I should have checked that before I signed up. Good luck. Good luck, Boaz. The, the Scudetto fan base is, is behind you. If I'm, anyone I'm wants sure. to sponsor me, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so are you, have you done absolutely no training for this? I mean, I've been running regularly, but um, considering I, I was planning to run the full marathon, I'm really not there. So it's going to be interesting. Okay, and as part of your training, presumably you're, uh, you, you've, you've got beer this evening. Of course, it's crucial. It's carbs. <laughs> what, what have you got? I'm, gonna have a, I'm going back to the start. I'm having a Brewdog Punk IPA today. <laughs> Is this the first of many uh, song puns that you're going to give us? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, well, I've got a Beavertown Neck Oil Session IPA, which is pretty great. Uh, and yeah, I've, I've had a, a pretty pretty decent week myself. Nothing hugely exciting to report. Uh, but yeah, obviously a lot going on in uh, in Italian football. So A lot going on globally as well, but maybe not for this pod. Yeah, perhaps for our uh, political podcast. Yeah. That, that one was. But right, let's, let's start with the Villarreal-Juventus game uh, last year night as we're recording on Wednesday finish 1-1 one, one. Uh, I think uh, let's start on a nice positive note because Vlaovic obviously with that that goal pretty much as soon as the game kicked off I think it was 33 seconds in uh, by UEFA's official timing the fastest goal by a full debutant in Champions League history if you're uh, one for your stats was uh, what a start he's had at Juve yeah it's almost like he's um Predestin- he's a predestinato. He's, he was born to do this. I was really impressed with the fact that uh, for his goal, for a start, it was with his weaker foot, but also the the speed in which he decides to take that shot would, took everyone by surprise. But I think yeah, um, the minute he scored is l- less important to me and whether he's uh, the fastest debutant, although some people can, kind of enjoy these stats. But uh, overall, a, a great debut performance for him, even, or, even though I think he only had about 24 touches in the whole game, one of which was the goal, and one created a very strong chance. So, I mean, in a week where other strikers are being criticized for very few touches, 24 is not the greatest amount of touches, but <laughs> Vlaovic showed that uh, with such few touches, you can be instrumental. Yeah, I wonder what other striker you could be speaking about, Boaz. Yeah, no. Perhaps one for your, your Premier League podcast, that one. <laughs> <laughs> but let's let's stick with, um, with Vlaovic, because, I mean, he said after the game... Um, which I guess is uh, kind of just reinforces what you said you, you were talking about there, that he wasn't that happy with the fact that he had scored a goal because uh, Juve went into that game wanting to win it. Uh, in his words, the, the, the mister wanted to win it, the team wanted to win it, I wanted to, to win it. And I mean, that contrasting with Allegri's, what I thought was kind of a, a strange post-match press conference because he said... Uh, he said we were too pretty and, you know, I'd like us to be nastier, which, I mean, I kind of take exception to. I mean, I, I feel like maybe Juventus, you know, had this game in the palm of their hands and uh, didn't didn't capitalize. They weren't pretty or adventurous enough, uh, if, if you ask me. But was, was this, this was a wasted op- opportunity, wasn't it? Yeah, I think a team like Juventus should really be beating Villarreal home or away. And uh, with all due respect, and I think the way the match set up, you really thought that Juventus could hit uh, the yellow submarine on the on the break and maybe get another goal. Instead, as the minutes passed, they felt it felt like uh, they were dropping further and deeper. And uh, this is, seems to be part of Allegri's master plan, and it 
it goes back to what you just said. It's it's not particularly pretty, uh, so I don't know what his uh, reference was to. And also, <laughs> it's it doesn't seem to be effective so far this season. So I think particularly mm-hmm. with a player like Vlavic, who we just uh, praised, you'd think that Juventus could maybe be a little bit more um, forward uh, thinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, talking about things that aren't particularly pretty, we should probably speak about that Rabio tackle. I think pretty much universally agreed that he was very, very lucky not to be sent off for what looked like it could have been a leg breaker, really. I mean, what what was he doing? I mean, I think there's a bigger discussion to be had about Rabio here because Rabio has now played 112 games for Juventus and he was a regular starter for Sari, for Pirlo, and now under Allegri. And he also plays for uh, France mm-hmm. under Deschamps. So probably or possibly there's something that we're not seeing that he gives to the team. But um, from when I watch the, a 90-minute game with Juventus, it always looks like he's one uh, cock up away from uh, from doing something yeah. bad. Before we get on to the, that foul of it, it was horrible. I have to say that he did take a lot of the blame for the the goal Juventus eventually conceded. But I think maybe he wasn't the only player to blame in that situation. But we'll get on to that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that uh, that tackle was uh, pretty criminal. And I mean, I'm not sure why VAR didn't intervene in this particular case. And uh, it felt like it was right for VAR. And the Villarreal players were rightfully aggrieved. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, thankfully, it wasn't as as bad. Uh, the, the outcome wasn't as bad as it as it could have been. One player who did obviously come off with a a bad injury uh, from that game was McKenney, who's uh, I think he's really been coming into his own. But uh, he had a scan. He came off injured and had a scan very very quickly. It has to be said after the game that revealed uh, two metatarsal fractures and that he's expected to be out for for two months i believe is the the time frame uh it, it's a bit of a blow to you over this isn't it we were just spoken about what rabio gives i mean losing mckenny has to has to be a blow i think uh mckenny really shown when he came to say at the beginning of last season and then maybe he slightly faded away mm. in amongst uh the general boredom that was juventus <laughs> and uh i'd agree with that and this season i don't think he's particularly shown at any at any point in fact i think the most times we've mentioned him was when he got up to some extra curricular activities yeah but um when you look at the juventus um squad he probably gives the midfield something that none of the other players do give yeah and uh that's some dynamism something that's yeah. slightly unexpected both positive and negative and uh, yeah it, it'll be a big miss in at the moment when they have a few other players out with injuries the only slight positive that I might take from this is that maybe Allegri will be tempted to play Locatelli a little bit further forward instead of mm. in the mid-zala position where he's playing now, which, he, yes, he is very effective, but it does keep him further away from the action. Mm. Right. I mean, we, we should move on from uh, from Juve shortly. But before we do that, I think we should probably speak briefly about the, the Derby della Molle, Juve and Torino drawing 1-1. Any key takeaways from that? So, I mean... Of course, this is all. This is a part of the, our bigger chat about Juventus, but we really have to praise Juric and Torino for the way they handled themselves in this game and probably the way they handled mm. themselves uh, so far in the season. They they really were a thorn in the side of Juventus and uh, the result is more than justified, I felt. So, I mean, for, from a Juventus point of view, it was disappointing, especially because they're kind of chasing the... Champions League spot, and at the t- at the time there were there was a possibility to climb, but we'll we'll get onto that. Also, Juventus really didn't show much uh, much purpose in that game, which is funny because again it goes back to what you said. Allegri was claiming that uh, Juventus should be uglier, but I don't think they can get much uglier than that. And uh, I got to I have to praise uh, Torino defender Bremer, who I think I I think we mentioned him in the past, but. He's having a stellar season. I wouldn't be surprised to see him move to a bigger club at the end of the season. And uh, there was a joke going around uh, the internet saying that when Bremer gets back home uh, from training, he puts uh, his house keys, his wallet, and uh, Vlaovic on the side of his bedside <laughs> table. So. Very good. Very good. Uh, right. Well, as we as we wait for Bremer to, to potentially move on, why don't why don't we move on uh, away from Juventus and talk about? The the roller coaster 
that is Roma under Mourinho. Um, so another game in which they had to come back from, from behind to, to claim a point. This time, two down, they were uh, against Verona. Managed to come back after being d- down by those two goals at halftime by, by relying on some of the lads from the, the Primavera to, to help them clinch a draw. I, I think the story that everyone's talking about after this game is uh, Jose Mourinho, though, and uh, his sending off for the kind of Calciopoli-inspired um, gesture to, towards the referee uh, and then refusing to, to show up for the presser. Uh, Boaz, I... I mean, what's your what's your take on this? Is this uh, is this box office or is this you know just a bit of a pain in the arse? Really. <laughs> so I mean, first of all, this is Roma's uh, third draw in a row, and you considered it if they'd managed to make the three points out of at least one of these games, they could also be pushing into that uh, Champions League reckoning. So it's like it's another opportunity missed, in my opinion, by Roma. And uh, in this game in particular, I mean, Mourinho can uh, pump, him, pump his chest out as much as he likes and act uh, all pompous about the fact that they managed to equalize so late in the game. But realistically, mm-hmm. as you just mentioned, they needed two players from the Primavera who are actually managed by De Rossi. So, you know, um, it's hard to give Mourinho much credit considering how um, Roma actually performed. With regards to his uh, gesticulating off the field, I, I thought that... Uh, that was uh, it was in poor style and uh, the fact that he only got a two match ban for it is a little bit laughable but this is Mourinho yeah. this is what uh, Roma have bought into and by all accounts the the fans are completely behind him they they've lapped up his uh, show so for, uh, if they're happy uh, who am I to complain and the only thing that um, I might add is that Mourinho is getting a bit carried away if he thinks that the the powers that be are are in any ways worried about his Roma side Mm, yeah, and obviously it wasn't it wasn't just Mourinho because there's uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of people involved were involved in this uh, in, in the fracas as as it were with uh, bands being handed out left right and center and additional repercussions for for Zaniolo as well. So yeah, this was um, you may remember in a few games ago there was a Roma Genoa nil nil and. Zaniolo got a goal in the 90th minute, which was then uh, cancelled by VAR due to a foul in the build-up. And uh, eventually, Zaniolo was also sent off for his uh, protest against the referee. The repercussions from this are that uh, Roma, who earlier in the season were praised for hiring a ref consult, they hired a former referee to be their uh, official consultant, so he could explain to the players what, what how to not to foul or I, I'm not exactly sure. I guess they'll explain the rules to the players better. Or who who if who better than Roma needs needs this explanation. But in any case, the gentleman in charge of uh making sure that the, the Roma lads know how to uh re- how to be better with the referees apparently entered the referee's room for it after yeah. this game and he's not uh signed up to in the Fiji G in any way. So now Roma are up for an even He's up for a big band. There's a lot. There's a lot of fines going around. It's just not really spectacular. Yeah. And yeah. Maybe uh, maybe we should give a little mention to the fact that uh, the Friedkins have been uh, very quiet throughout this whole process. And while at the beginning of uh, the season or at the beginning of last season, we kind of praised them for their uh, the fact that they were detached from the club, the fact that they let the people at the club run the club. It, it's times like these when you maybe think that a statement from the the owners might kind of um, kind of uh, give some sort of uh, focus to the whole uh, ambiente. Yeah, um, I, I I just kind of feel like I can't really help them to be honest with all of this kind of circus going on off the field. I mean, it's kind of worked for Mourinho in the past, you know, the the us against them mentality, even so much so that it's kind of become a bit of a cliche in itself. But I mean, with the results that Roma are producing, they can just do without this. All of this kind of focus on non-football related uh, goings on, to be honest. And you bit, use bit of a shambles. You use the word circus. I don't think there's a, a a better description of what's going on at Roma right now. Yeah, right. I mean, talking about circuses, uh, the the results at the at the weekend just across the board in the top eight were. Pretty unbelievable, uh, to be honest. I think there was only one team, Fiorentina, the only team in the top eight to actually register a win. 
It was like that scene from the, there was an old silent movie where a bunch of people all come up to a door and the one guy is like, no, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you're gonna... Yeah. It was that. Yeah, it was. I mean, what turned out to be, what, what looked like it was going to be Milan uh, throwing away their kind of position at the top. They ended up actually a point further ahead at the end of the weekend, bizarrely. But but there you go. I mean, Inter losing to Sassuolo, Milan drawing to bottom club Salernitana, Napoli snatching a point at the end against Cagliari. We've mentioned we've mentioned Juve Torino, um, but then also Fiorentina beating Atalanta for the third time this season. So I mean, where to begin? Really, I guess I guess we start with Inter Sassuolo. Uh, Sassuolo, who have been really really hot and cold. Uh, not that long ago, they were losing four two to. Verona and 4-0 to Sampdoria uh, and then in recent weeks they seem to have just turned it turned it around really I mean unlucky to use to, to Juve in, in the cup uh, and then with 10 men narrowly missing out on beating Roma and then beating Inter 2-0 I mean the, the Inter game was one of the games that I watched this weekend actually and as good as Sassuolo were, and they were, I think it has to be said, really, really great, like absolutely clinical, well organized, and not in a kind of negative defensive way, just really, really on it. As good as they were, Inter really weren't at the races. I mean, what what's going on? That's like one point from the last three league games, and of course, also in in amongst the the mix, that pretty deflating defeat to Liverpool at San Siro. I feel that this particular defeat was probably um, tainted by the the Liverpool result in particular. I think that maybe there was some sort of a psychological hangover from the midweek game. And um, once again, they lost 2-0 at home. In this game, their collapse was a little bit more uh, more visible. And Brozovic not being on the pitch, as well as Bastoni being uh, banned, probably had a bigger weight than uh, than we thought would. Uh, mm. Essentially, Brozovic feels like a player that is uh, essential to uh, any plan. Any plan Inzaghi put on, and credit has to go to Conte for the way for the way Brozovic has come along as well. But in any case, um, I think an- another big issue for uh, Inter right now is that Lautaro is just not clicking. Uh, he's had more or less the same amount of shots on target, chances that he had at this time last year, but he scored way fewer goals and with. Romelu, Romelu Lukaku moving to Chelsea. We really expected uh, Lautaro to take the Inter defense on his back, the Inter attack onto his back, and let's face it, he has not done that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, also, I think worth worth mentioning the sort of defensive solidity the Inter have had. Uh, I think there was some stat I'd read earlier on today where Inter had gone six games without conceding a goal uh, before Christmas, and now. In the the ten games since the turn of the year, they've conceded in, in eight of those. So, uh, Gazzetta even mentioning um, Devry pros- possibly being uh, shipped on at the end of the season with reinforcements coming in. I do think we have to give uh, plaudits to Sassuolo. I mean, I, I mentioned it briefly there, but they they started absolutely on fire with that early goal, and you have to say, even though Inter improved after the break. I think Sassuolo probably deserved uh, the the two goal cushion, not just the three points, but 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 the two goal cushion at the end. This is also a season where Sassuolo have gone away and won at uh, Milan. They've won at Inter now, and they also won at Juventus. So um, although their results are all over the place, you can't discount them in in one of these games. And I think part of that is the fact that they kind of enter the pitch with they don't seem to have much much worries on their shoulders at all. They're the the game is uh, their gameplay is very fluid and they're fun to watch. Yeah, yeah, you're actually preempting an honourable there for uh, later on. I was going to give Sassuolo, but yeah, the first team to beat Inter Milan and Juve away from home in the same season since 1956. So let's just get that honourable mention out of the way, nice and early. Uh, <laughs> right. So I mean, next up for Sassuolo, it's Fiorentina. Uh, who are also absolutely on fire at the moment. They they beat Atalanta 1-0 in the early kickoff on Sunday. I mean, this was a rather bad-tempered affair. I actually felt Fiorentina quite lucky to, to to come away with the three points on, on this occasion. I had no complaints in, in the cup. But, I mean, Atalanta having a, a goal contentiously ruled out for, for offside, 
Atalanta probably just about shaded it in terms of uh, you know who, who played better on the day. But then obviously, just to add to sort of that bad temper, Gasperini getting himself sent off again, which incidentally, I don't mean to go on a monologue here, but um, incidentally, a, another great stat in the Gazzetta that for the third time in a row now, Gasperini will have to watch Atalanta's game against Sampdoria, uh, which will happen on Monday. It'll be the third time that he watches an Atalanta Sampdoria <laughs> game from the stands due to suspension. Maybe he has um, an issue with Sampdoria. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like he's doing it on purpose. Um, so you missed the games in February 2021 and October 2021 as well. Are these home games or away games? So, well, obviously the one earlier this season would have been uh, at home. Um, so. Okay, I thought, I thought maybe he had an issue with Lugu- Liguria in general and yeah, maybe it's too heartbreaking for him to go back to the to the Luigi Ferraris. Who knows? But Boaz, let's have some words of praise for Fiorentina. Uh, in terms of points obtained, you know, at this stage of a season versus the same time last season, I believe they're the most improved club in Serie A. They had a bit of a roller coaster spell in January, but between the Coppa and Serie A, that's three wins in a row. They're five points behind fourth place Juve with a game in hand as well. Could they? Could they possibly make the Champions League? Never say never, although it's obviously quite a tough ask with so many other clubs in the running for it. But uh, linking it to our Vlaovic talk earlier, you you have to feel for Vlaovic a little bit because he, he's mm. moved from uh, Italiano's amazing football to what Allegri deems uh, some sort of football. And it must be depressing. And as you can see, uh, Italiano is already getting a song from Piatek. So obviously, yeah. he um, his uh, his attacking football is already imprinted on the new players. And I think I think while losing a player of that immense quality is a big blow. Fiorentina moved well in the win in the winter transfer window, and I think the players yeah. they brought in will be very functional to the, to the game. So can they do it? Yes. Will they do it? Unlikely, but I, I, stranger things have happened, and I, I personally have very fond memories of Gabriel Batistuta scoring at the Emirates. So I, I'd love to see Fiorentina in the, in the Champions League again. Yeah, and what a story it would be if uh, Vlaovic moved to Juventus and then Fiorentina pipped Juventus to the Champions League Ooh, spot. Narrative. Narrative. Um, You've right, jinxed so it I'm, now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Scudetto curse will strike. Sorry, guys. Sorry, Fiorentina. If there fans. is one, if there is one guarantee. Right. So that I mean that's I think one of the kind of big games next weekend or or the ones ones worth tuning in for anyway, Sassuolo Fiorentina on Saturday evening. The other box office game uh is Lazio Napoli on Sunday evening. Obviously with Sarri uh taking on his his old side. So I mean both of these uh, these uh, teams have big games on Thursday night uh, which will probably be the the day that most of our listeners actually hear this episode and uh, Napoli have the the big game against Barca um I mean that was a great showing in the first leg of that Europa League game Boaz wasn't it Yeah the, uh, Napoli were highly impressive particularly defensively and I thought the penalty they eventually conceded was very harsh although by by the rules it is a penalty but it it felt like maybe Napoli deserved a little bit more from that game. Although yeah. you have to say that the ricochet of that game was that they, they were terrible against Cagliari and very lucky to even get a point, as Paletti admitted himself. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, I mean, that, that was another one of the games that I watched. I mean, they, they, I think that they did have all sorts of injury problems uh, kind of coming into this game. But you have to say that Cagliari were by far the better team. As you mentioned, Spalletti obviously conceding that. Um, Lazio, meanwhile, another of the top eight sides to drop points last weekend with a draw in Udine. Uh, But setting that aside and the Coppa Italia collapse to Milan, they've quietly put a decent run of form together. Um, They'll be trying to overturn that 2-1 deficit against Porto on Thursday uh, but in terms of the, the, the game at the weekend, Boaz, who do you fancy for this? I have to say that uh, this is maybe where uh, Napoli will begin to stumble. I, I said that earlier in the season that I'm not sure Napoli have the quality to have a, to put through a, a full Scudetto race, although I'll be happy to be surprised. Mm. But um, Sarri's teams, they're, they're, as we said, they've been very hot and cold so far, but 
when things click, they really do click. And at the moment, it, yeah. it feels like even the Udinese game, they were overall quite positive and I, I wouldn't discount them. Let's put it this way. Yeah, right. And in the interest of uh, doing a roundup of the, the eight sisters, as people were uh, predicting at the start of this season, which it kind of has turned out to be, but as what do you have to say about Milan just about scraping a point against bottom side Salernitana? Uh, I think the caveats to this result was were that uh, Salernitana have appointed a new manager and uh, he's kind of a specialist in uh, relegation battles. And so it, it's, not, it's not a surprise that suddenly Salernitana were a little bit more solid. And also they've signed a few players in January. That being said, their last results have been draws against the likes of Cagliari and Spezia, who are relegation threatened. And uh, this is, I think, the first time in about nine years that the team who are top of the league do not beat the team who are bottom of the league at this stage of the season. Yeah. Overall, I think it's uh, mostly a mischance by Milan. Uh, there was a few yeah. individual mistakes that led to the goals, so you can't really blame the, a, a tactical approach, but... Milan is starting to show an issue with beating small sides. I was looking at the results this season and there's a few stumbles here and there. And you think that if Milan could have got even a draw out of a few of these games, they'd be putting a lot more pressure on Inter, who unfortunately, for me at least, still have a game in hand. So um, I think, as I said, I think particularly with the results of uh, the results over the weekend and the fact that uh, Sassuolo were always going to be kind of a banana skin for Inter, I felt that... Uh, mm. A match against Salernitana was a, a fine chance to uh, to win the game, particularly since uh, they went ahead. Yeah, definitely an opportunity missed. Uh, right, okay, let's move on to best of the rest in that case. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Atalanta's owners, the Percassi family, who have sold a 55% stake in the club to a consortium led by Bain Capital managing partner and Boston Celtics co-chairman. Stephen Pagliuca. No relation to um, legendary no goalkeeper re- Pagliuca. I believe no no relation. But uh, I don't know. Maybe our listeners can, can let us know if we're uh, overlooking a, a story there. Elsewhere, Samp's third all-time top goal scorer, Francesco Flacchi, returned to the field after a 12-year ban uh, playing for Eccellenza Club Senior. Uh, Flacchi tested positive for cocaine twice. Um, which obviously led to led to the ban. Italy women lose to Sweden in the Algarve Cup on penalties following a very positive 1-1 draw. And it's been reported today that the 2022 to 2023 Serie A campaign uh, will begin in August, on August the 13th to 14th that weekend, which is going to be bloody hot. Um, if if anybody's been in Italy at that time of the year, so yeah, obviously an early start to the season due to the the, the World Cup in Qatar. But no rest uh, for the wicked. We just had a Euro, and now it's straight into it. I know this is the genius of deciding to move the World Cup. Of uh, but uh, yeah, we've got a couple more bits to, to get through here. So Roma's oldest season ticket holder, ninety nine year old Eliseo Lorezetti. Uh, has sadly passed away, but some nice touching messages from Roma's social media accounts about that. So nice to see there. And finally, TS forces Lille to pay 20 million to Sporting Club for Leao. Previously, it had been um, it had been determined that the player would have to to pay the cash money, but that has uh, now obviously been ruled to not be the case. It's kind of a bizarre scenario because uh, if you you may remember that back in the day the fans broke into the sporting training ground and threatened to beat the players up and did kind of end up hitting some yes. of the players and a lot yeah. of the players kind of rescinded their contracts out of it but because Leao was considered a, a promising star Sporting refused to rescind his contract in particular and this is where this whole situation stems from um, so I mean. I think this has some sort of uh, repercussions for Milan's Mercato as well because it means that uh, mm. they, they'll they have more money to spend or, and also Lille are one of the teams that Milan are linked with a lot of their players. So interesting to see what happens next. Mm. Yeah, will be. Um, Boaz, perhaps you can tell us about the Italians abroad now 
in your regular section. Play that theme. Play that theme. Theme tune coming up right about now. It's time for Keeping Up With The Italians. I believe we've never been to Brazil in, as part of this segment. So here we go. Eder, who you may remember was part of the Euro 2016 Italy side, scored his first goal for Sao Paulo versus Santos. I didn't even know he was still playing. So good on him. Paolo Tramizzani, who manages in Switzerland for FC Sion, has been banned for four matches following his red card last Sunday. That's four matches banned for. That's more than Mourinho for doing for something far less uh, bad. But mm-hmm. let, we won't get into that. Alessio Lisci continues his uh, great management spell at Levante by beating Atletico Madrid at Devanda. And uh, following the end of the winter break, the Zerbi's Shakhtar are supposed to kick off on Saturday versus Metalist. But of course, with the ongoing crisis, I'm not sure yeah. if that game is going to go ahead. Cedric, one for our political podcast. The one for okay. our sister political podcast, yes. Uh, Cedric Calombo scored a wonderful overhead kick in his debut for Tsarko Salo in the Bulgarian First League. And my man Fabio Borini scored a penalty in the 1-0 victory by Kara Magurk versus Sivaspor. Elsewhere, Domenico Coppola, who in the past had appeared in, for Italy for, in their youth sides, has moved to Armenia to defend the goal of FC Van. Sicilian striker Andrea Compagno scored for FC Ukraiovia in the Romanian First League. Pasquale Sensibile is the director of sport at Galatasaray. Sounds like a sensible appointment. And um, lastly, I mean, and I was going to give, uh, I was going to mention Antonio Conte's mad celebrations in the 3 2 victory against Manchester City. But since then, there's been kind of a, let's call it yeah. breaking news that just happened a few minutes after we, we began recording. But in any case, he seems to have given a kind of a sack me or back me uh, speech to the media after yeah. a loss to unexpected loss to Burnley. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm sorry to say, but Tottenham Hotspur is the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, that's a bit like uh, a bit like Roma, really, what's going on there at the moment. Right. OK, let's move on to the honorables and dishonorable mentions. Boaz, thank you very much for, for keeping up with the attendance, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to start off the honourable and dishonourable mentions uh, by giving a dishonourable. I believe it's our only dishonourable this week. So uh, complete contrast. The, to yeah, last exactly. Week. Yeah, this it's a dishonourable, but again, it's a it's a Morata challenge entry <laughs> by uh, Deyala for Cagliari when they were one nil up against uh, Napoli, and yeah, I mean, th- this was three potentially crucial. Crucial points for Napoli. A uh, huge upset it would have been. And the uh, ball was floated across to him absolutely perfectly. And uh, keeper at the opposite post. He, he's on the, the six-yard box and has the entire goal to, to aim at and somehow manages to hit it directly at the goalkeeper. Uh, so, yeah, dishonorable mention. Uh, Morata challenge entry. Uh, Boaz, you have an honorable mention for, I'm not sure if this is Koulibaly or Spalletti or if it's a, a dishonorable for Spalletti for, for a sly dig at Totti, perhaps. Since we're um, on a general positive vibe today, let's give this honorable to Koulibaly, who had an excellent game uh, against Barcelona in the midweek, having just come back from as the African champion. And uh, as you alluded to there, Spalletti said that Koulibaly was the best player he has ever coached, which is uh, a little bit uh, rich considering he did coach one Francesco Totti, but yeah. the two aren't on best of, ter- of terms, so maybe maybe there was something to that too. Mm. Right. Okay, and I'm giving my regular uh, goals honourable mention. Uh, tough week to pick this week. Uh, there were some some great efforts, notably I think Quagliarella, Belotti, Bonazzoli, but I don't know. I think this is your impact on me, Boaz, that there were just so many shoddy goalkeeping mistakes involved in those goals. Um, the winner uh, this week is going to be Eduardo Bove. A nice positive for, for Roma, obviously, after all the, the negativity that we've just discussed. But yeah, for his goal and his part in the youngsters' rescue job, uh, just a, a great effort that kind of took everyone by surprise at, at the near post uh, so hints of uh, goal goalkeeping uh, errors there as well, but I mean, I think of all of the of all of the kind of goals this weekend, that was probably probably the best, and also just nice to see a youngster uh, get get on the score sheet. Um, but as an honourable mention for Marco Verratti, yeah, Marco Verratti played the full ninety minutes in the Real Madrid versus PSG Champions League tie, and while um, the headlines obviously went to Mbappe, who got 
a goal in the 94th minute or elsewhere maybe went to Messi who missed a penalty. But uh, Marco Verratti was mm-hmm. imperious in midfield. He was he had a 92% pass precision rate. He, he won uh, all his uh, duels. Uh, basically, fantastic uh, performance. And it, I, I think we've said this in the past as well, but it will be a great shame once uh, Marco Verratti retires to know that he's never played in the Serie A. But what a player. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Second that. Uh, right, I'm giving an honourable mention. I'm kind of stealing your or wading into to your terrain here, Buzz. I'm giving an honourable to, to Milan, who have announced uh, that their fans are able to. Well, th- let, let's let's say initially they're the reduced prices for the upcoming Serie A game against Udinese, but beyond just having sort of very reasonably priced tickets which would be great to see in, in other leagues that shall not be mentioned. Hmm. Um, they have also announced the uh, fans, I, I believe it's fans under under 30 and over 60, if they want to, to bring friends with them and sit in uh, certain areas of the stadium, they can bring up to three friends along for, for just one euro, which I think is a, a great initiative. And uh, yeah, good to hopefully get, get San Siro nice and... Uh, well, to, to 75% capacity, I guess, for that, for that one. And as you know, I've recently booked a vacation to Italy. And unfortunately, there are no home games in the period when I'm there. So I'm um, a little bit gutted. Yeah, might have to bring it forward a little bit, Buzz. I'll, I'll explain to my family and my job. <laughs> yeah. You do that. You do that. Yeah, you've got an honorable for Diego Stramaccioni. Basically, uh, Juventus under-23 player uh, Stramaccioni was uh, footage of him knocking Rabiot to the floor while they were playing uh, the piggy in the middle game uh, w- was shown on social media. And considering uh, Juventus' is injury crisis, it could have been a pretty bad uh, blow. But then again, considering how bad Rabiot has been in recent uh, appearances, maybe Stamachoni was uh, thinking forward. Right, okay. So, I mean, that, that, that kind of feels like it should maybe be a dishonorable, but I'm, I'm happy to... <laughs> He's acting in the greater interest of the club. <laughs> right okay right so i mean next up for me was an honorable mention for uh sassuolo um for that feat of beating inter milan and juve uh, away from home um so i w- we'll move on to your next honorable mention which is for daniele de rossi this is an honorable mention for um world cup winner daniele de rossi who uh had some great bands with world cup winner marco materazzi basically marco materazzi posted a, a picture of uh the room where he keeps all the shirts he's collected over his career. And it looks like a cupboard that's essentially packed with shirts. And uh, Daniele De Rossi commented, that's all very nice, but uh, where do you keep uh, the, the player's shins that you broke? <laughs> oh, harsh. But I mean, probably fair. Right, and just to, to, to finish up, I mean, we've mentioned the the sort of positives and negatives of uh, Antonio Conte over the last uh, over the last few days, really. Uh, we mentioned them earlier on in, in this episode. Uh, but I'm still going to give Antonio Conte an honourable mention for the post-match press conference following that dramatic Tottenham win over uh, City, um, where he said that uh, current Lecce director of football and former Fiorentina director uh, Pantaleo Corvino, who said to him, you can pick the wrong wife, but you can't get away with picking the wrong striker or goalkeeper. Uh, so a not so thinly veiled message to Spurs chairman Daniel Levy, I suspect there. Yet another not so thinly veiled. <laughs> yeah, before the uh, upfront message to, to Daniel Levy that, that came tonight as we record. Uh, right, that's all we have time for this week. Uh, but... Thank you. Well, thank you, Boaz, first of all. Uh, but thank you, uh, everybody, for, for tuning in to listen. Uh, as ever, please do subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whichever platform uh, is your favorite. We will speak to you next week. Until then, enjoy the football. <laughs> Thank you.